All right, we're going to start a minute early because that's a minute closer to the lunch break. <clears throat> this panel, I think, is really interesting in that, and here I'm going to use the very overused, overtired metaphor of people all touching different parts of an elephant, that the part they touch you know, tells them a lot about the trunk or the leg or the tusk, but doesn't tell them overall about the elephant, but altogether, perhaps, they can piece together a sense of this elephant. And I think about that very much in this panel that covers a whole bunch of things that are very important to healthcare, from kind of more traditional, okay, what do we do about aging patients and nursing homes to kind of more cutting edge with the rise of direct-to-consumer technologies in the healthcare space. So I think it really illustrates the breadth of this topic and how private law has impact on a variety of healthcare functions. So to start, Rebecca Wallets, who is Assistant Professor of Law at Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University, is going to kick us off with her presentation, Shareholder Resolutions and Access to Medications. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, today I am speaking about shareholder resolutions and access to medications. And to motivate the topic, I thought I'd first start by mentioning two big reasons to be excited and interested about shareholder resolutions. So the first is that shareholder resolutions are a relatively under-examined tool in the access to medication space that falls under this umbrella theme of private regulation. And second, um, Shareholder resolutions complicate what I refer to as sort of the standard narrative of investors in large drug manufacturers. Now, what is the standard narrative? Well, what I'm referring to as the standard narrative is this line of critique that basically puts access to medications challenges at the feet of stockholders, right? So putting on that hat of the critic, we've got shareholder, a view of shareholder primacy operating in the background that has this directive that the purpose of corporations is purely to maximize shareholder value, meaning that shareholders are basically causing all of our troubles with access to medications challenges. Taking that hat off, of course, you know, that gloss is a bit fast. There's a lot to unpack there. I don't necessarily subscribe to it. Um, but that's the basic shape of the critique that's on the table that all of us have um, come across. And so I think you know, this criticism conjures up for many of us what we might have in our head is this mental picture of the investor and large drug manufacturers, people and institutions who really do not care where their returns come from, whether they're based on unjustifiable price increases, high launch prices unmoored from any sort of value or even stifling generic competition. You know, so long as the returns are satisfiable to the investors, everything's okay. And so part of what is so fascinating about shareholder resolutions in this space is that here we've got some shareholders who actively do not fit this mold, right? Uh, some shareholders of large drug manufacturers care about how these companies comport themselves and the impact that they have, that conduct has on patients. Now, of course, these shareholders may be outnumbered, and spoiler, they, they often are, right? And you know, at the end of the day, they're still investors, so there's mixed motives here. But this is a phenomenon that is worth studying and taking a closer look. Um, and so with the goal of spurring interest and continued discussion in this tool, here are the three questions that I focus on in the paper and that I will briefly touch on today. Um, you know, what are access to medication and shareholder resolutions? What are this mechanism's strengths and weaknesses? And then how might this tool be best used in the access to medications space? So I won't spend too much time on uh, going over these basics. Um, you know, sh shareholder resolutions are uh, proposals that are put forward at the annual general meeting for the entirety of the shareholders to uh, vote on. These resolutions are typically advisory, meaning that even if you get a majority vote, the corporation doesn't have to pay attention to them. That said, they do pay attention. Um, the end game here or success in this context is not necessarily getting that majority of vote. It's all about that direct engagement between shareholders and corporate insiders. So you have that ongoing um, dialogue to hopefully achieve the outcomes that the shareholder proponent is interested in. Finally, the last thing I'll note here is that we've got federal regulations governing 
this space. So they've got eligibility requirements, procedural requirements, and, a, and then a bunch of substantive exclusions um, that a corporation can use to bounce the uh, shareholder resolution off the proxy. The default being that if you've got a shareholder resolution, it has to be included unless you meet one of these exclusions. So, um, drug pricing and access to medications resolutions are often contested, meaning that directors and managers um, <laughs> fight them, right? They, they go to the SEC looking for no action letters, and then even if the proponents get the resolution on the proxy, uh, the board often issues a statement in opposition trying to convince everyone else to vote them down. Uh, and so this is to say that with contested proposals, we've got different factions of the corporate ecosystem vying for power with the federal agency kind of inserting itself as an arbiter over whether or not a proposal is sufficiently meritorious to be put to a full shareholder vote. Okay, so Shareholder resolutions in the access to medication space are a tool that have been used at least since the late 1970s. There's a range of proponents that have put them forward, um, and they commonly express twin themes of concern, concern about returns because they're investors, but then also concerns about these negative externalities imposed on patients and society. And many proposals from decades ago still resonate with the issues we're grappling with today, which kind of suggests a rather bleak outlook about how you know, slow change has been. Um, but what I do in the paper is I focus on some recent themes that I think are particularly interesting uh, new, newer directions. And these are proposals regarding the potential misalignment between corporate mission values of a corporation and its political spending, uh, links between executive compensation and access to medications concerns, and then finally reporting on patenting procedures and access to medications. Um, specifically, this new round has been thinking about secondary and tertiary patenting practices. Um, we don't have a lot of time here, so you know, I just have one example here, which is from Gilead. So you can at least see what these things look like if you haven't seen them before, right? You've got a support, a, a resolved clause. In this case, they're asking for third party review and then eventually a report about that potential misalignment between what Gilead says and how they act. Um, and then there's a supporting clause um, that is a bit of an advocacy piece explaining you know, the reasons for why they're asking for what they're asking. Okay. So that's a bit of a whirlwind, but of course we're interested in what are the strengths and weaknesses of this tool, right? So here are what I view as the potential strengths, um, and strengths for the prospect of access to medications reform. So first, this tool harbors the prospect of being more nimble when compared to legislative reform. So if we use the Inflation Reduction Act as an example and the Medicare drug direct drug price negotiation provisions, that's an idea that's been around for decades, right? And we are only now seeing it um, be part of our law today, right? Uh, and so with shareholder resolutions, there is that immediate direct engagement with corporate insiders. Um, and the timeline for these things is such that you could have potentially change within a year, right? Um, if corporations are responsive. Uh, second, barring some kind of constraint, shareholder resolutions can complement legislative efforts um, by hammering home the same idea on multiple fronts. So back a couple years ago when we had California's you know, price transparent, drug price transparency law with respect to price increases, at the same time that those asks were being made externally, we had shareholder resolutions basically demanding the same information from companies. So um, complementary strategies. A third strength here is the symbolism of the messenger. So uh, you know, who the messenger is seems to matter, right? It matters that it's the shareholders telling the drug manufacturers, hey, hold on a minute, as opposed to just an external regulator coming in and saying, we've got to change things, right? Uh, and relatedly, when it's the shareholder putting forward these concerns, their critique of the corporation is bound up with ideas of corporate self-determination, right? So even if the goal or outcome to be achieved is the same, whether you're pursuing it through legislation or shareholder resolution, shareholder resolutions have this fundamentally different orientation. Um, shareholders, through their resolutions, have the opportunity to ask themselves, 
and those who serve the corporation, the big questions about self-governance, right? Who do we want to be as a company? What norms do we want to subscribe to? Even if certain conduct is legal, maybe we shouldn't be engaged in it, right? And that was uh, an example that came out in the paper with the AbbVie patenting stuff, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and again, you know, these questions about corporate self-determination are distinct from those of the regulator charged with sorting through what constraints they ought to be putting on these corporations for the good of society, right? So just a different set of questions. I think both sets of questions are important to be thinking about. So that's strengths. Um, weaknesses are kind of the flip side of that coin, right? So as a tool fundamentally about self-determination and shareholder democracy, shareholder proposals really aren't an ideal tool or your first line of defense for systemic change, right? This is a tool that goes company by company with individualized results. So even if you've got the same shareholder resolution put forward at five different companies, you're going to see variation in the voting patterns, for instance. So different corporations engage with these things in different ways. Um, we've also got the problem of <laughs> shareholders not being elected officials, right? And there's divided interests here, and finally, you know, it feels a little awkward, if not inappropriate, to be looking to shareholders of a particular drug manufacturer to protect the public interest, right? And the fact that we're doing so kind of points to, you know, what one might assume is failed public institutions, right? Because otherwise, why would we be looking to private shareholders to be taking on the mantle of promoting the public interest and relying on those um, institutions and individuals' talents to be able to convince all of their shareholder colleagues to be on board with this mission, right? Um, so those are strengths and weaknesses, and I am almost at time, but of course we want to know how might these be best used. Well, I think there's a couple lessons that we can distill here. And first, I think it's possible that shareholder resolutions could serve in this gap filler role. So they might be especially important when there's something that we can't achieve through external regulation. Maybe that's a practical issue, maybe it's a legal issue. Maybe the government cannot legally regulate in a particular way, but we uh, could use a shareholder resolution to um, achieve that end. Second, um, shareholder proposals might be uniquely positioned to address those access, aspects of access to medications challenges that more squarely intersect with in internal governance issues. Um, so you know, typically, the frame here for uh, shareholder proposals is that they're an accountability mechanism. So maybe they can be used as an accountability mechanism, not just for financial. Um, reasons as they're typically talked about in the literature, but for non-financial reasons um, as well. And the policing of that relationship between principals and agents might be one that is best suited to this sort of private ordering, um, which there are no sort of pure examples here, but maybe oversight of executive compensation would be one. Um, and then again, I would just say that the messenger matters, and even if the resolutions don't change the outcomes, they're symbolically important, and they, again, going back to that standard narrative, complicate what we think about as the relationship between shareholders and access to medications challenges. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, so let's go around the room. I see Christine and then Assis. Um, thanks so much for doing this. One thought I had, and you may have considered and already kind of like rejected including this, but another example that I was thinking of were um, shareholder resolutions brought by the Teamsters against wholesale drug distributors, yeah. um, very relevant to drug access, and it was focused on kind of opioid epidemic, and so actually kind of the over-release of these drugs to the population. And, um, and so I think it also might be worth looking at um, well, also like there, there I think there's kind of a complement to litigation rather than necessary regulation and kind of how to hold these companies accountable, um, and specifically the executives for the companies accountable. Um, and then I just wonder too if it's worth breaking out a little bit more kind of differences in who is bringing these resolutions and their motivations. And I just kind of see two buckets here. One is kind of just like, this would be better for the business writ large because of kind of like the broader public is really upset about this and maybe we want to avoid actual congressional action, so let's kind of get ahead of the issue. Versus like from the Teamsters and some other like, you know, um, you know, funds that might be bringing this where it's kind of like you have harmed our people and like we really kind of want to punish you and like kind of hold you accountable for causing that harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can really go down the rabbit hole when you're looking through these different shareholder resolutions. Just quickly on the opioid point, um, you know, there are several shareholder resolutions that have been put forward in the past couple of years about saying, you know, you can't. 
um, insulate executives from litigation risks um, with their compensation packages, right? So you should be able to um, make adjustments. Uh, but I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Go next. Um, so I've been thinking about shareholder resolutions and that their like overall effectiveness in the abortion context post Dobbs, because I think a lot of corporations are bringing um, shareholders are bringing shareholder proposals, resolutions, so forth. Um, and I've noticed that some of them are working with nonprofits to kind of shape their framing and to kind of also organize. Uh, and I was wondering whether you, what you see is the role of external actors and nonprofits in kind of helping. Um, shareholders kind of organize, but also kind of shape their framing on how they can use it as a tool, and what the responses from corporations are to kind of seeing uh, nonprofits on the outside of the corporation kind of shaping that language and shaping those organization efforts. Yeah, um, I mean, so the abortion issue raises an interesting question because there's you know proposals on both sides of that issue, right? And so it raises larger questions about whether this is a good tool to have in general. About you know, um, but in terms of organizing, there are associations where there's individual members that are a number of nonprofits or. Um, socially minded asset managers, and it does seem to be that there's a lot of coordination. So you'll see the exact same proposal, but with a different main filer at different corporations. So um, I think there is a lot of organization that's going on in this space um, and coordination. Some in the literature have suggested that um, proposals are more successful when you've got a large pension plan um, in the background because maybe they're better resourced um, and that those proposals might get more um, traction because of those sort of resource uh, considerations. So before we go to Jackson, I'm going to use moderator provocative and mm -hmm. cut in for my question. When I read a lot about corporate governance these days, ESG is something that comes up again and again, is something that has really had a groundswell, but also something that is maybe beginning to have a backlash, and certainly some of healthcare policy would probably fall into the ESG bucket. And I was wondering if you've seen that influence health policy related shareholder resolutions or if it seems to be a little bit separate from the ESG movement. Well, I think, I mean, so what's kind of interesting about ESG is how you actually draw the lines between social and governance, right? So I think historically we might have more squarely put some of these proposals in the social proposal bucket, but if you're talking about changes to executive compensation, right, you're, you are talking more about sort of the internal workings of the corporation and, um, you know, governance issues. Some people draw lines between governance and compensation issues, but for our purposes, we could kind of put those two things together. And so I think it's worth thinking about the ways in which shareholder resolutions might be uniquely suited to access to medications challenges that really can be traced to these governance issues that would be most appropriate for shareholders to be um, inserting themselves and their ideas into as opposed to an external regulator. Excellent. And then I did promise Jackson, and I think he'll probably be the last. In some cases, like CalPERS, they're bulk purchasers. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the opposite of ESG. When is it in the interest of shareholders to reduce these prices because they're on both sides of the transaction? Do you yeah. see that ever happening? I mean, I think it would be an empirical question to work out. Um, but I, I have seen suggestions that state pension plans should be particularly interested in these issues. Um, because it's seniors who need these uh, you know, excessively priced medications. And yet, it's also the pension plans that rely on these returns to fund these groups' retirements, right? And so there's a real, real tension there, um, which I'm not quite sure how you would resolve. I think it would involve some sort of empirical analysis. So I misspoke. We have time for one last question, if somebody has, has it. Tom? Oh, Thomas, sorry. Thomas, sorry, sorry. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and sometimes I think um, whether or not there's a way for us to treat shareholder resolutions as a metaphor in terms of legislative process. So often, right, in Congress, we see stuff 
put forward for 10, 15 years before it gains traction um, and begins to get the kind of steam behind it that is required to now take bipartisan action. Um, and whether or not you see impact or there's evidence of impact from repeated ongoing year after year showing up to make the case um, to push the dynamic, um, and whether or not these proposals, like in a larger frame, we see um, just individual firms pushing things, but also if it starts to move markets um, and act as an external signal, which I think it's like if there's something across the literature around that happening in other spheres outside of health, um, could really help to think about how you might frame this as something that we need to remain committed to, even though we see stumbling blocks. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. So I, I think another out, a context outside of drug pricing and health law would be um, the push by investors to get increased board diversity. So that is an effort that shareholders have been engaged in over a period of years, right? We've also had external regulation in this space. You might recall California tried to legislate this. Um, but there is an area where there has been a lot of success, and um, you could trace some of that back to shareholder efforts. Um, so I think there is sort of this brick by brick mentality of you know pushing pushing um, certain ideas forward that is certainly at play in this space. Um, one thing to be cautious about is that if you have not um, really strategized about how much support you have for your particular proposal because of how the federal regulations work, if you put it forward and you don't have enough votes, percentage votes, um, after a certain period of years, you can't bring that same idea forward um, for a couple of years, and so you have to like a waiting period before you can come back to the table. Um, so there are sort of strategic considerations there as well. All right, thank you very much. We're going to move to our next contribution on the panel from Jimena Benavides, lecturer and postdoctoral associate, Yale Department of Political Science, affiliated faculty, Yale Institute of Global Health, and resident fellow, Information Society Project at Yale Law School. She's going to present on the need for health equity-driven CROs, a stakeholderism approach to biopharmaceutical innovation. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, thanks for reading the BSA. I won't, um, I won't um, go into details into this essay, but mostly I will um, try to give a road map of what exactly um, the, where this is going and how I pretend to narrow it. That said, um, I changed the title of the essay, so now it's uh, Private Equity Firms and Digital Clinical Trials, if it's a partnership for equitable access to medicines. And I am aware that um, I am way over the word limit. So one of the purposes of this of these, um, conversation is how to narrow it. And I also wanted to see how these essay talk to the other papers, so this was, this was phenomenal, I, and I found a lot of commonalities. Um, so to start, this essay provides a review of the current state of digital clinical trials, also known as uh, decentralization of clinical trials, and private equity firms growing interested in this field. Um, In-person participation in clinical trials um, only in the U.S. is not optimal. 5% of the U.S. population um, only participates in clinical research, and more than 70% of the U.S. population has not um, the resources so to access these academic medical research centers. They just live like two hours away of a medical re um, um, research center. So this brings a problems of patient enrollment and demographic representation, which in clinical research is important to produce enough evidence and equitable, um, equitably assess the safety and efficacy of drugs. Hence, the operation of clinical trials uh, represents one of the first crucial opportunities to support access to quality medical treatments, or on the other hand, become a primary barrier to equitable access to medicines. Um, the utilization of clinical trials, this is bringing trials to patients rather than mobilizing patients to the um, trial uh, sites, promises a greater and diversified trial participants' representation, lowering the trial operational costs, and accelerating the speed of production of evidence to support health innovation. Um, although the digitalization of clinical trials goes back to the beginning of the 21st century and has been more active during the last um, um, decade, um, its fastest growth is most visible um, with the pandemic. So the industry founds in trials a lucrative business opportunity. 
private equity firms and um, clinical research organizations can profit from the practice of research, research trials, whether a drug is approved for market or not. And pharma can reduce investment risks and separate the operational cost of running a trial. And to give you some um, big numbers, 11 of the 25 private equity firms identified by PitchBook as the top investors in healthcare sector have bought stakes in these clinical research organizations. Out of 87 research size acquisitions taking place since 2020, over 65% were acquired by private equity firms. And the high number of private equity deals in healthcare in general in 2022 alone, an average of two to three transactions per day, makes North America rank first among all regions. And this is a fact to take very seriously as US pharma already accounts for 50% of the global pharmaceutical production. Aware of the potential ethical concerns and data flows, uh, overall, it is fair to say that digital clinical trials are a good thing for health equity. Yet, the increasing participation of private equity firms raises important concerns to that end. This essay explores two questions around the fact that private equity firms are highly interested in running and control clinical research trials um, in the course of um, their digitalization. First, why are PE firms attracted to these digital clinical trials? Um, private equity firms are increasingly attracted to this field due to the trial sector's growth. It's, it's growing super fast, um, the big fragmentation of the industry and resilience, particularly in the years following the pandemic. Um, I, I examine with relevant data each of these three aspects in this essay, summarizing them, private equity firms are drawn by the prospect of low risk and high returns, the growing demand of pharmaceutical outsourcing, the opportunity to reduce operational costs with um, consolidation, and a minimal regulation of trial sites consolidation that already exists and also to private equity firms. The second question this essay asks is, why is private equity firms growing interest in digital clinical trials a problem or a potential problem? Um, evidence on health equity shortcomings from private equity firms involvement in other healthcare fields like hospitals or nursing homes creates reasonable concerns about their participation um, controlling digital clinical trials. Um, in the words of Professor Farrow, um, private equity firms in healthcare are corrupt fiduciary vampires with MBAs. So now this essay elaborates on additional reasonings on why it's a bad idea for private equity firms to run clinical trials detailization. Um, first, I look at the biology of private equity firms, how they own and control operations and decision-making processes why their returns expectations in the short term make reputation in the long term irrelevant. So they basically have no incentives, no even moral incentives to um, care about health equity. I also look at the regulatory approach to um, biomedical innovation. The um, private equity um, business model may contribute to the dominant consumer regulatory approach that already we have at the biopharmaceutical innovation and the supply-driven business models. There is a deep-rooted understanding of drug manufacturing as a consumer protection issue, which has favored a product-focused regulatory order that hinders the social value of science. Under this model, innovation priorities are often determined solely on the basis of demand, um, who will use, afford, and have market access to a novel um, medical product, subordinating unmet medical needs, that is, access and public health concerns. Um, so private equity firms controlling trials just reinforce this um, understanding. Um, in some, with considerations of equity and access to health technologies already lagging in clinical trials governance, um, critically, and critically expanding private equity firms' um, business ideology into the medical research industry is really quite concerning. And because of the private nature and lack of regulation, private law and corporate self-determination in this field might be an advisable field to look at claiming moral responsibility. Um, probably this is not an essay um, um, offering possible avenues, but more failures of private law or, um, or just claiming that we have to be more critical when we look at who are running 
uh, the process of detailization of clinical trials. Thank you. Wonderful. So I see Glenn has raised his card. Yeah, so I guess I want to ask the question as against what? And so here's how I would put it, right? Here's a simple syllogism that's probably wrong, and I want you to tell me where it's wrong, right? All things equal, decentralized clinical trials prove equity by representation as compared to non-decentralized clinical trials. All things equal, private equity investment increases the number of decentralized trials. Mm -hmm. Therefore, private equity investment also increases the diversity of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So one of those propositions has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell me where I got it wrong. Okay. Um, if I am following you well, um, yes, I mean, okay, so private equity firms can overcome some of the current challenges that we have in clinical um, in clinical trials, right? Um, enrollment and, and, and representation, demographic representation. That's true. But I think that comes with a huge, huge risk of, because they're profit seekers, they're going to probably, um, so they are going to increase this approach to consumer-driven um, focus on, on, on clinical trials. So just claiming that they're going to increase representation and, 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 and demographic representation, they can, um, and this is, I mean, again, there is no evidence. We're at the beginning of, of this, um, of, 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 of seeing what will happen in the market. They can increase um, significantly the use of, I mean, in the name of representation, they can advocate for a lot of profit in the clinical trial um, uh, business model, right? Um, and, and the problem is that these, um, these sector in specifically, they do not, they lack of regulate, regulatory um, implications in the, in, this, in the field of clinical trials and also in the, in the field of private equity per se. So there are two, um, two fields where with lack of regulatory, with lack of oversight, and so these risks are, are, um, are much amplified. All right, Mark, I saw your hand up. Yeah, it's probably a continuation of that initial conversation. Um, um, Aaron sitting next to me and I have been researching this field of private equity, and we, we've concluded that um, uh, almost, uh, I think, uniformly, whenever you see private equity interest in a healthcare sector, it's because the, the investors have figured out some way to exploit uh, market power for uh, a reimbursement rule uh, or something of that nature uh, in ways that uh, others uh, have simply been less reluctant to do so. So they take opportunities that are exist and take it to an extreme as, as, as earlier. Um, and so it, it, rather than, well, capital is needed and they have the capital or some sort of insight is needed and only they have the insight. Um, so it, it makes me highly skeptical that there, that there can be any good uh, news to this, even though uh, some uh, I'm sure better ways of running uh, clinical research trials are out there. So, you know, with that skepticism in mind, you, you, you think that's warranted in this instance? Or uh, is there that uh, um, their eyes on, you know, exploiting reimbursement or market opportunities, or um, is there some sort of, um, you know, larger uh, efficiencies uh, that are achieved that uh, by combining networks of, of, of research participants, maybe thinking sort of like, uh, uh, what is it called, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. If I want to do an online survey, I don't go and recruit a bunch of people, they've already recruited them for me. And so that, that was a, Smart idea that uh, network formation, I think, has some distinctive uh, economics and attitudes that might well um, produce, uh, you know, value without, uh, you know, exploiting uh, various other uh, social um, loopholes. So, anyway. I think it's, it's really critical, regardless of which um, method we use to reduce these inefficiencies of the way we run critical research um, trials right now. It's what exactly is, what kind of principles are informing this um, um, in inefficiencies governance. And, and, and my concern is that through private equity firms, the, the, the main principle is going to be uh, profit seeking rather than public health concerns. Um, I, I, 
I'm not aware about these um, kind of networks of research and how they are combining. Um, again, I guess the principle is exactly the same. As long as um, all these strategies are informed mainly by um, public health, equity, I mean, understanding safety and efficacy as an, an access concern, I think um, um, that, that, that's the ultimate goal. So, but I don't believe in, in one rule applying to all kind of governance strategies. So definitely, um, in, even in that, um, in that case, again, we will have to apply these um, different frameworks. The one I apply is more a political economy to see if, if that principle is at the core of the governance strategy. Thomas? Um, thank you for the paper. I actually didn't realize that um, private equity was creeping into CROs too. Um, I guess my question, it's on the same lines, um, and I guess what my, where my brain is going is, there, is there actual bad news, which I know we have to wait and see, but I think traditional CROs are also doing the profit maximization game and engaged in the same process. And so I guess what I'm looking for you to clarify is why this is actually like different, because it's not delivery of healthcare in the same way that we fear private equity in that space, because we're trying to get drugs to market and make a ton of money. That's why people get right to human trials. Um, and so I wonder if the concern, also if you have to think about um, statutory structures like um, and I taught bioethics, forgive me, I don't teach FDA law, but the, the, um, the common rules, kind of FDA, um, of course my brain is losing words and I'm wasting your time, but that we have these um, regulatory oversight structures for clinical trials and what part that might play in assuaging your worries, but also if they're about money and about being more efficient, is there the possibility that they get really good at um, recruitment and getting people to trust systems that they haven't trusted before? Thank you so much for your question. So um, I have been, two things to respond to your question. So one, I have been working on, on the data about, um, about um, private equity firms and digital clinical trials with a private equity shareholder project. I don't know if you know them, there are no... Um, activist group, um, specifically with Michael Finn. He's a research coordinator. And one of the conclusions um, he has, and also we, we share, is that there is no enough evidence or data. I mean, not because there is not there, it's just because it's not accessible at this point. So it's hard to tell uh, if there is already a bad outcome of this kind of marriage. So it, that's, 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 something, that's something difficult to say. Um, then the second fold, um, I was also talking about and brainstorming about these. I mean, can we already speculate about a bad outcome with other um, uh, health professors? In particular, I was talking about um, to Alison Hoffman. Um, she, she lately, a couple of weeks, presented a, a work about private equity firms, again, in the healthcare space. And again, she, she was also sympathetic about uh, drawing these negative outcomes that come from nursing homes and hospitals. Again, I am 100% with you that these are different scenarios. One is providing care. The other is caring, but uh, through access to medicine. So that, that's why I was trying to pull from these, um, what is exactly the kind of um, regulatory approach to it that we have in the U.S. to biomedical innovation. And that's why I was using these frameworks about supply-driven and consumer protection and how the FDA regulatory uh, role is framed within this um, sponsorship model, which actually it's not Sponsoring, sponsoring really that much. I mean, we can, we can be critical about this sponsorship um, role of the industry. Um, yes, I'm 100% with you. Barbara, do I see you sneaking in the last question? Do I have time? Mm -hmm. I found your paper just so interesting and really touching on an important problem of how do you eliminate bias because you get a bias data set if you can only do in-person uh, clinical trials in academic medical centers. And this is a kind of broad searching question. If private equity investors have a short-term perspective, could that be a good thing? Because if you look at the long-term perspective of a drug manufacturer, they want the drug to make money for 30 years, which means they pick drugs that will serve rich people who can buy the drug. And perhaps 
this digital clinical trials can over the short term get a more representative data set of drug development without being so distorted by the long-term prospects of the drug as a profit motive? Yeah, um, that's a great question. If it's, it's also another concern that I had, and it was also brainstorming that with um, John Murley, uh, who does a lot of uh, corporate uh, research and private equity firms and hedge funds, and also um, with um, one of my co-authors, uh, Matthew Herder. Um, he's doing a lot of um, research and innovation uh, in, in, in clinical trials, and two different answers. <laughs> so uh, for the corporate um, um, point of view, it, it seems to be a good thing, right? Um, uh, but for the innovation uh, field, not just because, I mean, two things that, so we are outsourcing the production of evidence and knowledge, right? And that could take really a long time. So a long run model would be ideal here and you will set up the principles for access in the long run. So private equity firms stepping into this kind of model won't be ideal, right? From the corporate approach could be ideal just because they're, if, if they even narrow even more, even more within the clinical research um, business model, something more specifically, for instance, just recruitment. Right? Not production of knowledge, but just re recruitment of, of patient uh, participants. That could be ideal uh, from a corporate uh, perspective. Right? Always the concern is tech transfer. Right? How do we produce knowledge if we're setting the principles for access to knowledge in the long run? And for that, private equity might not be the best answer. OK. Thank you so much. We are now moving not quite into a Monty Python, something completely different, especially since you referenced Alison Hoffman and her work on nursing homes, but a little bit of a shift in the panel's focus with Barry Furrow, who is professor of law and director of the health law program at Dextrell University Klein School of Law. He is going to present the hollowed out American nursing home using private law to police poor quality and expand owner responsibilities. Thank you. It's, it's so much fun to be here today, to read all these papers with overlapping interests in private law. I mean, it's really very exciting. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun already. And I, I shout out to Mark Hall and Aaron Fuse Brown for their terrific article in Stanford on physician roll-ups and private equity. My colleague Rob Field and I and David Hoffman and Kevin Louds, a Deputy Attorney General in Massachusetts, have a huge article coming out in the Drexel Law Review like next week, and it's up on SSRN now. And it looks at similar questions like this in nursing homes with the addition of uh, False Claims Act templates for how to use how the government can use false claims to go after private equity. So let me quickly summarize my paper, which of course all of you have read with great detail, I'm sure. So I'm going to lay out the highlights of it. Some of this is very familiar because we've already had a good presentation on CROs and private equity. And uh, here's the world as we look at it. 70% of nursing homes are owned by for-profit 24% are not-for-profit, and not-for-profit probably doesn't mean much because the same impulses for revenue generation are the same. And only 7% are government-owned, and we know that uh, Marion County and the 1983 case that was just handed down by the Supreme Court opened some litigation doors for private law against nursing homes for dispensing psychotropic drugs, for example. That's about the only door, and discharge. So we're left with private equity owning 11% and, and rising at the moment, although their investments may be dropping off, in American nursing homes. And so we have a largely privatized system, which we've already talked about, I think, at some length. And Bill Sage's discussion is right on the money here in terms of privatization in the healthcare system and the consequences of it. So I'm going to talk about these three points as part of my building a case for the role of private law 
frankly, in developing a complaint, because I've looked at a lot of complaints here, and how do you develop a complaint? What are your theories? What's the private equity model? Why is it worse than other private investor models? What kind of tort doctrines have we seen that advance potential for litigation against large corporate entities like this that are very confusing? And what about fiduciary law? And uh, I'm ready to wrestle with Lauren on this one because I'm shifting my focus to institutions. So the highlights. I probably would add two or three more categories, but this is enough for now. I mean, these are, optim these are opportunistic fiduciaries, as I call them, pirates with MBAs. I tried vampires. It's a little <laughs> less attractive. So you've got what we've already seen as high rates of return in a short timeline of three to five years. You'd like to make 300% rate of return. It's exciting. Wouldn't you like to dip into this pool yourself in your 403B? Vanguard was toying with the idea of opening it up to the rest of us. Number two, debt as a profit tool. You have the uh, RETs, REITs, where you load up the uh, acquired firms with high levels of debt. They end up paying high amounts of money as they try to operate a nursing home. And you have high levels of bankruptcy at a rate 10 times the normal bankruptcy rate in the corporate economy. You see the picture. Number three, high rates of churn and ownership. You get instability for a population that can't tolerate instability. Where nursing homes, especially if they go bankrupt, means you have to you have transfer trauma risks with the residents of the nursing homes. Four, you've got staff reduction programs. The first thing you do with a private equity firm, whatever the, whatever the acquired party is, you look to reduce staff or reduce the qualifications of the staff to save money. Your goal is to save money. That's always the goal with staff. Blood from a turnip. Nursing homes are understaffed, poorly staffed, uh, poorly trained staff who work three jobs, three different nursing homes. We start with a problem when we make it worse. Uh, five, we have related party transactions, and this is brilliant. This is what I call skimming the till. You start a pharmacy program you start a staffing program. You don't play in the marketplace where you're looking for the cheapest provider. Oh, no, you provide it yourself, and you raise the prices until medic between Medicaid and Medicare, depending on where the patient moves around, the charges are suspiciously high. And Medicaid, sometimes looking back, says, why are we paying so much for services that we shouldn't be paying? And then you've got the multi-level corporate structures, which is a way of disguising and making it very difficult, frankly, for lawyers. It's, you can move to Texas, which some nursing homes have done, or you can simply make a, an ownership chart that is so complicated with 40 or 50 different subs that you don't know what to do as a lawyer. And it's kind of paralyzing. So you end up with arguably poor quality care, and the studies Gupta's study is probably the only one that's really solid, talking about increase in 90-day mortality and, uh, among Medicare residents, or 20,000 deaths over 12 years. And that's a pretty good data set. So where do you start? Just start with health care as an enterprise. The law is, private law is very slow, it seems to me, to change. So you look at the evolution of tort law, which I've taught since 19... 74. It's very slow. You need to forge oh, the side on. Sorry. Do you want me to do it? Yeah, why don't you? So you've always had hospitals with physicians as independent contractors. We got rid of the charitable immunity defense, but we are left with the independent contractor defense. And Pennsylvania, I will credit Pennsylvania for this. It's led the way with regard to Thompson v. Nason. And uh, there's a typo. And for duties they developed, really, which are all about the hospital's duty to take care of everything within its four walls, including credentialing and retention, very critical part of it, oversight of all kinds. It takes the Joint Commission standards and amplifies them. And that's hospitals. So why is that important? Well, Pennsylvania has slowly expanded so that corporate negligence applies to HMOs and managed care organizations. 
medical professional corporations, assuming they provide holistic care to their subscribers, and finally to nursing homes in Scampone. And so we see a progression in state tort law, not just in Pennsylvania, but in 30 other states, to capture what we already knew, that hospitals are entities, and they provide care to their patients, and their parents trust them, their, their patients trust them to provide that care without regard to the status of physicians. Okay, next slide. So that's the corporate law, tort law piece of it. And there's more to say on it, but enough said. Because the third part of my argument is how do you build a presumptive fiduciary duty? And by presumptive, I mean, let's create a presumption that nursing homes have a fiduciary duty to their vulnerable residents so we don't have to leave poor plaintiff's lawyers with a clear and convincing standard to surmount or a heavy burden of proof. And so in much of fiduciary law, there is a presumption. If you're a trustee, you have a presumptive duty to your beneficiaries. In a corporation, there's a presumptive duty of loyalty and so on to the shareholders. And so I would offer a two-step approach or three-step approach. One. Look at the Medicaid statement of best interests of recipients as the core of a fiduciary standard, which is really aimed primarily at state operators of nursing homes and private operators, anybody who gets Medicaid money. And then vulnerability, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Vulnerability is a sort of an expansion of the notion of uh, the vulnerable in any trust relationship. You just don't know as much as your trustee. And it overlaps with the problem that we think everybody's opportunistic, that it's a world in which we don't really comfortably have total trust in our trustee, our banker, because there's always fast dealing. There's a the temptation. There's always temptation. And fiduciary law lists acts in part to push back against temptation. I know I sound like a Pentecostalist preacher, but I think that's probably embedded in the core of fiduciary doctrine. There is a core of sinners' temptation. Let's make the law push back against inevitable temptation for all of us, especially when we talk about making a lot of money. So the third part of the argument, the third leg is anti-opportunism. Because if you look at fiduciary law and you really dig around you look at Henry Smith's work here at Harvard on fiduciary law. They dig deep in equity notions and fiduciary notions, and you look at self-interest seeking with guile. Talk about describing private equity. I uh, can't think of anything better. And opportunism, as Williamson says, involves subtle forms of deceit. It's not very subtle. That's why we're academics. We're trying to peel back and show it's not subtle. Mm -hmm. There are lots of ways in which this is clearly stripping assets from a business that takes care of the vulnerable. So vulnerability, Louisiana case gives a wonderful description of this, and this is often quoted in the Pennsylvania cases, Illinois. It's like the courts are latching onto this, and they're beginning to say, yes, this is a good argument about vulnerability of patients uniquely in nursing homes, more strongly than in hospitals, more strongly than research subjects and CROs. It's a very strong case. They're vulnerable. Everybody takes care of their needs. They have total reliance. They have to. They're cognitively deficient rapidly in nursing homes. And so the Schenck court, the, the interesting statement that's been latched on by other courts is if entrusting one's money to a receiver or conservator Create, created a business relationship, one would hope at least in principle that entrusting a valued family member to the care of a business entity such as a nursing home would carry similar responsibilities. That's good analogic reasoning, you know, looking at the essence of the environment, okay? And opportunism. If you look at fiduciary law and you look at cases over time, you find Quasi-fraud or near-fraud as a characterization for uh, nursing, for the fiduciary in all kinds of different situations. And I think it very much describes private equity. I mean, what else would you say? If you go back to my list of six, 
And there's probably a seventh, I would add, which is the use of uh, psychotropic and antipsychotic drugs to, to kind of calm down residents, to harness them in effect, to calm them down. That was a point of the Marion County case that 1983 could be used against state and county facilities, particularly with regard to the abuse of drugs like this. And OBRA 87 was trying to get at that same thing. So what you end up with is private equity acts opportunistically, and that is one of the legs of building a fiduciary duty. And I, my response to Lauren here is, you need equity, equitable powers. So next slide. You need the equitable powers to make fiduciary law robust, to make it muscular. And I love equity tools. Don't you love it? Disgorgement, <laughs> accounting for profits, unwinding. These are tools of bankruptcy courts. They're tools of equity. Equity is written into 1983 in many federal statutes. You have constructive trust, special masters. The courts can take on this power. And you sort of search in the case law because typically you get a motion to dismiss. And the counts always include fiduci breach of fiduciary duty. And then you never hear anything more because there's probably a settlement. So that's the problem of private law. It vanishes at a certain point, And you can't track it through. But Next slide. We do see a couple of cases that I think reveal something. So disgorgement. Rolfing versus manor care. Um, this was a case where the, they created a pharmaceutical, manor care created Vitalink pharmacy services as a related transaction for which they were overbilling. It was alleged in the complaint. And uh, the executor of the nursing home residence estate said, we want our money back, effectively. That they clearly, they were billing too much, and it's a related transaction, and we want disgorgement. Now, I don't know what happened. This is where the case, as usual, stops. But it suggests the court was quite willing to let it proceed to trial because they all withstood motions to dismiss so, all these cases. So, Barry, if I may just jump in for a moment because I see that Lauren, Bill, and Aaron have questions for you. Oh, okay. And I'm sure there are going to be some pretty tough questions, and I'd like to oh, see I've them put you through your sorry. pieces. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I needed the orange red light. Sorry. It's true. It would have come, but why don't we have... Yes. I've, why don't we have you three guys say your questions, and then yeah. Barry will kind of pick through and try to play a game of three on one. My apologies. It's hard to shut up. Yeah. So, Lauren, why don't we start with your question? Uh, first of all, thank you for trying to crack open my stone cold legal realist heart, <laughs> um, which which maybe maybe you've done a little. Um, so, my my questions, which I'll just throw out there. Um, so the first one is, where is the stopping point? So if we put this presumption into place in nursing homes, where do we go next? Does big pharma have a fiduciary duty to patients who need their drugs, right? Um, there are many relationships where you have those you know, power differentials, um, including throughout healthcare. Um, and, and so my, my point is, you know, does everything that touches on um, health become fiduciary, and in that case, what are we doing about these private actors? So the second part of my question is, how how do you expect the private equity firms to resolve the conflicting fiduciary duties at times between their investors and the nursing? Okay, so before you answer, we're going to hear Bill and Aaron's questions as well. Thanks, Barry. So um, on Pirates with MBAs, Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance were all members of the peerage. So I guess <laughs> Pirates with MBAs has a noble heritage. Um, here's a, a suggestion that you might actually want to take for a little bit of your chapter because it would be fun. 
Um, I had a conversation several weeks ago with one, of, I won't name the person because I don't know that it was a public conversation, but it was one of the people who we would all agree has both incredible expertise and all the right motives for improving care for seniors in this country. Um, and this person basically said bluntly, all nursing homes should be shut down. And so the, the challenge I would offer you in your chapter is to say, well, if we wanted to use private law to shut down nursing homes, or at least to clear out the private equity size that is doing all of this stuff that you object to, how would we do it? And then Erin? All right, so I'm going to have a gentler comment. Yeah. Um, I'm very sympathetic to your project, obviously. Um, and so I think in some ways it's the, how can we, how broadly can we apply the theories that you're developing? Can you, is it, does it apply only to private equity or could you say that any corporate nursing home chain is equally subject to the same principles? Because there's no, it, yes, private equity is short-termism and it's opaque, et cetera, et cetera, but like corporate investment in general could be equally accused of some of the same opportunistic behavior. So can you expand it beyond private equity? And two, can you expand it beyond nursing homes? And I think we've talked about this separately, hospice, right, is another one. Behavioral health, other facilities that are uh, that deal with vulnerable patients and use the same sort of revenue playbook or a similar revenue playbook. Can you also at least gesture to this is not limited to nursing homes? It can be applied beyond nursing homes. Okay. Well, let me see how I should start. I think I'll start with uh, Lauren. Um, I think this argument. I, as I'm making it, is unique to nursing homes as, and that's going to shade off into your question, as a hyper-vulnerable group. Because you go in a nursing home, you're dead in three years. You deteriorate rapidly, cognitively, typically. And uh, it's, a, it's a very unique population. It's not the hospital population. Is it assisted living? Not quite, not yet. No, assisted living is fine. So. And are patients who need drugs like this? No, I, I think this, I would say this is a one-off kind of situation where the, the opportunistic aspects in nursing homes are really abundant because you know, you've got a, re a resident group that can't detect or block anything and nobody polices it because uh, state inspections, 70% you, you, of nursing homes are not inspected over a period of three years. It's a very terrible process of inspections and regulating. It's not very effective. So it's, I think it's unique. So I would say in response to that. Apologies, it, it, you're in the red, so. So in response to Bill, why not? I mean, I think the industry needs to be re-visualized architecturally, care-wise, size of facility, what really works. If you just stand back and look at nursing homes and how you care with somebody who reaches that point of fragility, you come up with maybe the San Francisco model, very small units, much more caring, of course, much more expensive. The expense is always the problem, as you correctly point out, and we're kind of trapped in the private model, historically, in nursing homes as well. But I like your idea. And I think that's a very good question to ask. And Why stick with this model? And I'm channeling from really a subject matter expert, not my personal opinion, but... Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And then, as to you, Aaron, the question of whether uh, the problem with private equity is that its tools can be copied. You know, so you have other chain ownerships of nursing homes, and they, they look at some of these strategies, and they say, yeah, you know, Maybe. Staffing. Let's keep staffing at minimally adequate levels. Nobody's really policing us, so let's not worry too much about regulation. It's a risk. I think I'm, I'm, you've got to start somewhere. I would say private equity, this, this question of defining a relationship in, in, private, in fiduciary duty and equity is difficult, and it's something that scholars have debated about for decades. If this, then why not that? And so you've got to, I think you start with a very clear set of vulnerabilities. And I wouldn't expand it unless some of my six categories are satisfied. Most of them are satisfied. 
short answer. All right, thank you very much. To round out the panel, we have Megan Wright, who is Associate Professor, Penn State Law, Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities, Penn State College of Medicine, Assistant Professor, Department of Public Health Sciences, Penn State College of Medicine, Affiliate Faculty, Department of Sociology and Criminology, the Pennsylvania State University, and Affiliate Faculty, Rock Ethics Institute, the Pennsylvania State University, you must go to a lot of department meetings, <laughs> who her work is with, that she's presenting today is with Cindy Kane, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology, University of Alabama at Birmingham, and their work is Healthcare Organization Policies about the California End of Life Option Act, the paper victory of the medical aid and dying movement. So thank you. Um, that is a very long title, and it's actually missing an affiliation. But I am pleased to announce that as of July 1, the title will be Professor of Law, Medicine, Sociology, and Bioethics. So um, I am presenting on behalf of myself and my co-author, Professor Cindy Kane, who is a medical sociologist and an expert in the sociology of organizations. And I'll invite her to be responsive to comments and questions at the end of the presentation. So this is part of a larger project about the organizational mediation of medical aid and dying policies in California. So just briefly, aid and dying is an end of life option for terminally ill, competent adults who are residents of a state in which this is a legal option, and they can voluntarily self-administer the aid and dying medication that is prescribed by their physician. This is currently legal in 11 jurisdictions in the United States, and advocates for the right to die, this version of the right to die, have been relatively successful in spreading this particular option over the last couple of decades. In part, probably because public support for this is pretty high. If you look at public opinion polls, 72% of Americans support euthanasia, 65% uh, support aid in dying, including majority of those who identify as conservatives, 51%, uh, and liberals, 79% support this. Despite this high public support and the spread of this legal option across the United States, only a few hundred individuals die with this type of medical assistance each year. So in 2021, 486 individuals in California uh, used medical aid in dying out of about 328,000 deaths, which is well under 1% of, of all deaths in that state. So we've been interested in what can explain the gap between support for and use of this end of life option. And it could be about patient preferences, but it could also be about access. And in this paper, we address the issue of how a legal option may actually become unavailable to many otherwise eligible individuals because of how healthcare organizations constrain options for patients at the end of life through organizational policies and private agreements with affiliated healthcare providers. Um, so we focus on California. California legalized aid in dying in 2015, effective 2016, with the End of Life Option Act. And like in other states, California allows healthcare providers to decline to participate. These, these are individual providers, doctors, nurses, and so forth, and allows for healthcare organizations to opt out on behalf of their medical staffs and employees. In 2021, California amended the End of Life Option Act to require that healthcare entities post their aid in dying policies on their public facing website. So in the spring of this year, 2023, we conducted web-based research of all general acute care hospitals licensed in California to identify the organization's aid and dying policies. So there are about 355 hospitals. Um, we use uh, data that's publicly available from, from the State Department of Health on licensing. Um, 124 of those 355 hospitals posted a policy. So that's compliance of 35% of all hospitals. So many are non-compliant in, in posting their policies. But because a lot of these hospitals are part of health systems, we only have 39 distinct policies out of the 124 hospitals that post these policies. So a review of the policies and an analysis of existing research done by uh, Cindy Kane show that uh, for many individuals living in the state, 
aid in dying is only maybe a paper right or a paper victory, a lot of organizations are opting out. So uh, in Kane's research from 2017 to 2018, she found that there's about 60% about of organizations are opting out of participation. And even organizations that choose to allow providers to participate may add conditions to participation that make it less likely that otherwise qualified individuals can use this end-of-life option. So in our chapter, we focus on two organizations' policies to demonstrate uh, how there are barriers to access to this end-of-life option. So as I stated previously, the California law allows organizations to opt out. Participation in the End of Life Option Act is completely voluntary. And with respect for the option of entities opting out, they can again opt out on behalf of their employees and medical staffs. Now when a healthcare organization, such as a general acute care hospital, decides that its employees and physicians on its medical staff are not going to be participating in the End of Life Option Act, Patients who receive their care at this organization and from affiliated personnel will likely struggle to gain access to medical aid and die. In theory, they could go elsewhere. They could find another provider. But in practice, providers may not accept new patients solely to facilitate their death through medically assisted dying. Additionally, this is an option only available to the terminally ill. So these patients are actively dying and they're, they're very, very sick. They may not actually have the ability to go find care at the end of life and transfer. And uh, it's a very large state. They may not have the ability to travel to find other providers uh, who are willing to prescribe aid and dying drugs to them. Religious hospitals make up a significant share of the hospitals um, in California, and a lot of them have opted out of the End of Life Option Act. And because a lot of them make up large health systems, uh, patients receiving care through those systems are not going to have an, uh, access to this end-of-life option. We focus on the case of Dignity Health, which is a large health system uh, that is in California, but also other states, uh, to show how this may matter for patients. So Dignity Health, uh, their professed goal is to create environments that meet patients' physical, mental, and spiritual needs. They have 60,000 caregivers and staff who deliver care in 21 states headquartered in San Francisco. They're the fifth largest health system in the nation and the largest health provider in California. Uh, they are primarily a set of Catholic hospitals, although they do have some that are non-Catholic. Not surprisingly, given the Catholic Church's opposition to euthanasia and aid and dying, they have chosen to opt out of the End of Life Option Act. Um, and they're very explicit about this, makes their policies very easy to find. Um, they, they note in their policy that their facilities, programs, staff, and related operations are not going to be involved in aid and dying. And specifically, they will not be providing or securing an informed decision, providing or completing the written and oral request, providing any medication with the specific purpose of ending a life, or being present at the time of administration of the medication by the patient. So there are 29 Dignity Health Hospitals across the state of California, and its opt-out thus significantly affects access to medically assisted dying. So that's an example of a religious opt-out. Um, other hospitals will also opt out for non-religious reasons. If the hospital is the only hospital in the area, because it's a rural area, that's also going to significantly affect patient access. Even when an organization decides to opt in, and it seems like if a patient meets the statutory requirements for medically assisted dying, they should be able to obtain it, uh, the organizational policies might actually further constrain options beyond what the law requires. So in the chapter, we, we point out uh, the policy of uh, the University of California San Francisco Medical Center, which is an opt-in organization but it adds several additional conditions to participation, requirements for participation. Um, I think of them as barriers. So one way in which UCSF makes it more difficult for patients to obtain medically assisted dying is by requiring that their patients meet with additional providers beyond the two clinicians required by law. So the minute that a patient starts talking about it in dying, if they're at UCSF, they have to speak with a social worker and this is outside of the physician that they have a conversation or relationship with. And so they have to talk to the social worker about this. And then if they move forward the process, then their attending physician is required to refer them to um, another professional for a, a, a capacity assessment to make sure that no mental illness is affecting their decision to pursue aid in dying. 
And while they're trying in this policy to ensure that their patients' decisions are truly informed and voluntary and less autonomous, these additional appointments and assessments are slowing down the process. And again, given that these patients are terminally ill, they may actually die before they can complete the process with all the meetings of the different providers. Additionally, um, meeting with a social worker, meeting with another clinician to do the capacity assessment, these are individuals with whom the patient may have no pre-existing relationships, so there's a pretty significant privacy burden on the patients who have to explain their decision. And uh, finally, uh, the policy allows for anyone on the healthcare team to veto uh, the patient's decision if they have concerns um, about the patient. So someone can come into this process, like the social worker or the clinician administering the capacity assessment, and frustrate patient's autonomy. There are other parts of the policy that can reduce patient access. Um, so for example, the medication can't be dispensed or ingested on the premises. So if a patient is never going to be able to be discharged from the hospital, this is not going to be an option for them. UCSF only facilitates this for current patients, so they're not going to accept new patients solely for the purpose of using this end-of-life option. They require the patient to have conversations by themselves with their uh, providers. So if patients need assistance in communicating, like with trusted family members, they're not going to be eligible for this. And there are lots of paperwork burdens on the providers themselves. Uh, they have to make referrals to risk management and so forth, which may make the providers less willing to participate as well. So in brief, uh, even when organizations opt into the End of Life Option Act, these policies are not going to guarantee that otherwise qualified uh, individuals under the language of the statute are going to be able to use the end-of-life option. So uh, to conclude, our research shows that healthcare organizations, uh, many of them private, mediate medical decision-making rights granted by the state, and employment contracts with healthcare professionals and medical staff bylaws and staff privileges for physicians constrain involvement in medically assisted dying and affect the patient provider relationship. So we, we state, we argue that the spread of um, aid and dying across the United States may only be a symbolic victory for patient rights act advocates because in practice it's not going to actually be available to many patients. And we can see when you look at the descriptive statistics released by states on who uses this option, only the most privileged patients are actually doing it. These are patients with high levels of education and white patients. So uh, organizational policies are limiting patient autonomy, uh, which these laws are meant to increase. Uh, but the limits are primarily going to be experienced by rural patients, low-income patients, and patients with low health literacy. Thank you. That was a really interesting, thought-provoking piece. Before I get to Bill's question, a question of my own, hearing this, I couldn't help but wonder if you think that there are lessons learned for other areas of either politically or ethically sensitive care, such as we're going to have a panel on abortion and reproductive services this afternoon, or perhaps trans or gender affirming care. And if so, what might those lessons be? So great question. This is just a case. So all of these healthcare organizations have lots of policies that are mediating rights. Um, one of the things that I think is, is interesting about this is that uh, these are required by law to be public facing and a lot of policies are not public facing. So you don't know when you're admitted to a hospital what their policy is going to be and you may assume that you have a particular legal right uh, when in fact that's not going to be available to you. Um, I, I think, as a, as a first matter, I'd like to see more organizational policies be public facing. Um, again, it's not gonna help all patients if you don't know to look in advance to what the, what the policy is going to be, but at least if you're looking to transfer care or find the particular option that you want, you might be able to figure out who's going to provide that option to you. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, only 35% even follow the law, so there has to be a mechanism to ensure compliance for posting these policies. All right, so Bill was waiting, so he's got first question. I think it's a great research um, chapter and presentation, so thank you. I'm, I'm phrasing the question in a specific way. Um, so think just about California, think just about this issue. Um, if you, in the most visible way possible, um, showed your research findings, 
and there were a movement to have a, another um, voter initiative on this issue um, to close some of these loopholes and improve access. Tell me about the fate of that initiative. So it's my understanding, and Cindy can answer this a little bit more, but that the California legislature has been pretty responsive to research on this and has already made changes in the law. This, this transparency requirement was actually in response to researchers, uh, but I'll turn it to you. Yeah, I, I don't know what the fate of a voter initiative would be because I don't know how much voters are aware of well, I'm, how I'm much sorry, transparency I'm, I'm, they don't have. Yeah, I'm sort of inviting yeah. you to say, okay, put this issue back before the people of yeah. California, say <laughs> that you know there's now a symbolic right but not a meaningful right in this domain, what do you think the traction is to make it a meaningful right? That's the question. You know, the, the advocacy groups have been very successful and they're the ones who leverage the research that our team um, at UCSF and, and UCLA put together um, early on and they leverage that research to advocate for this transparency and for the change in the law to have the policies posted. So I think if, if that were to happen, the advocacy groups would also step into that stage and they would do a pretty good job framing the issue and I think it could be successful. Um, although it does get into a lot of detail and, and people when they're thinking about their relationship to healthcare entities I think are not fully aware of all the ways that these organizations are mediating. So I think it would require a lot of communication with voters about why this would be important. Okay, we're gonna go James and then Ben. Uh, sure, uh, great project. Uh, thank you for uh, presenting. Um, I think my question is uh, quite related. Um, it's sort of, I'd, I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about how thinking about the purpose of this statute interfaces with debates about textualism and purposivism generally. Because on the one hand, you might say, look, these opt-out mechanisms are in the text of the statute. The statute is working exactly as it's supposed to be. It is intended to ultimately be agnostic to how many people um, have access to this. It is an option if you really want it. Um, on the other hand, right, it does seem like it's in conflict with uh, sort of the broader purposes, at least the advocates who, who brought this uh, forward. And so just how do we how do we think about the purpose of this statute um, uh, or any of these statutes? Is this really a lesson um, for advocates about, you know, the things they shouldn't be willing to give up? Um, or is this a case study in which the purpose, like a clear purpose of the statute is really being undermined by strict adherence to its text? So thanks for that question. Um, so we've been talking a lot about advocacy groups, but I'd like to shift focus to patients. And one of the things that uh, I think is important, I don't think we have great research on yet, is that patients are frustrated. Uh, so separate from the advocacy organizations, they think that they have this particular option. They find out that they don't. Um, so Cindy's gotten multiple calls from patients contacting her, just a sociologist, trying to figure out where they can access aid and dying. So I think that that's a, a slight signal that the law's intent is being frustrated when patients can't find providers to do this. But then you, you see other sorts of organizations popping up to provide the service, like standalone aid and dying clinics, where you can go there just to get your, your prescription. So. Okay, Ben? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this uh, great project. Thanks. Super um, I guess I was just wondering about a, a pretty simple scenario where I would be a, a patient kind of seeking or, or opting into this arrangement and I have a, a, a guardian who can kind of speak on my behalf. Um, is there a mechanism through which the guardian can kind of overcome the, the veto? And maybe a, a broader question because you, know, you, were, you were thinking about how uh, California might be uh, uh, kind of a, a, a generalizable to the experience of other states. But as far as I can tell, California doesn't have supported decision-making laws or, or kind of policies in place yet. And so I wonder if actually in, in states that do, um, different results may, may arise. 
Yeah, so um, it's my understanding a guardian is not going to be able to do this on behalf of a, a patient in, in California. Uh, they themselves have to demonstrate capacity at the time the decision is to be made. Now, perhaps if there's a guardian or conservator of the property, but not of the person, they might be able to make this. But if it's a plenary guardianship, I don't, they're not going to have uh, access to this, at least under law. Perhaps in practice they do. Uh, but there's some paperwork that has to be filled out where people witness and sign that the person has capacity and is acting voluntary. Um, the support of decision making, uh, there is an open question about how these kinds of laws are going to intersect. I've made arguments that you might be able to use supported decision making to access aid and dying for individuals with cognitive impairments who otherwise would be excluded under the contemporaneous capacity requirement. Glenn. This is beyond the four corners of the paper, but I'm curious whether you have any sense about policy formation at or formulation at various hospitals, like UCSF in particular. Is it coming from the general counsel's office? Is it coming from somewhere else? So where we end up here and how we get there? Do you know who, who created that policy? I do know for UCSF, risk management was very heavily involved. That's not true for many policies. Many of the policies, it's the um, palliative care unit or the ethics division where the policies originate. Okay, Craig, we have time to hear your question, although perhaps not time for a full answer. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I was just wondering about like, possible judicial challenges because that seems part of the process of, you know, future was brought to cover and and since in many other people call Joe's Genesis, right? The idea of law being created, perhaps this side of law, maybe people challenging the law just as organizations create the law on one hand, and alternative narratives of the law being that could be advanced reports by Do you want to get David's question too? And then... Yeah, sure. Um, so, Craig, I just wanted to ask you about the technical question liability exposure for the hospital. Is it, uh, is there? Exposure? There are immunities. There's immunity in the statute. All the way it, Good faith reliance on the statute. Okay, so thank you to our wonderful panelists.